Hello and thank you for joining me for the last of the papers, paper three from November 2017, Edexcel Higher Tier Maths. So paper one, paper two has been the non-calculator and calculator respectively, but now obviously it's the final paper three. So let's have a look at how these questions panned out roughly five years ago when I'm recording this now. So questions do get harder as we go through. I'll try and show you a few methods if I think it's warranted. If not, if I just show one method, it's not to say that's the only method of getting the correct solution. So do like and subscribe and let me know if you're struggling with any questions after watching this video and I'll do my best to help you out further in the comments if need. Anyway, let's have a look now at question number one. Question one, we've got a table showing information about the heights of 80 children and what we need to do is to find the class interval that contains the median. So first of all, what we need to remember is that the median is essentially just the middle value. So the median child, imagine them stood in order of height from smallest to tallest. The median would be the one stood in the middle out of 80. So in the middle is going to be halfway. So we can just take 80 and divide by 2. So the median child will be 80 divided by 2. The median isn't 40, but it's going to be about the 40th child. So what we do here is a running total to see where we get up to at least 40. So I'm going to do a new bar here for cumulative frequency, which just means a running total. So this first row from 130 to 140 is just obviously the first four children. Are we at the 40th yet? No. We keep going and building up until we get to the first value, which is at least this value of 40 here. So the next one, 4 plus 11 is 15. We're not close to 40 yet. 15 plus 24, though, that takes us to 39. So the 39th child is the tallest one in the category from 150 to 160. But 39, we're not quite at 40 yet. So the 40th child will be the first one in this interval here. If I do 39 plus 22, that takes me to 61. So that tells us that the 40th comes after this interval but before the end of this one. So the class interval containing the median is from 160 to 170. So that's what we need to write down. So now we're off and running. We've got one mark in the bag. Next for part B, we're asked to draw something called a frequency polygon for the information in the table. So to do a frequency polygon, what we do is we need to take the midpoints of all of these intervals over here. So we're just trying to find which value is halfway in between this one and that one. So first of all, halfway between 130 and 140 is 135. You can calculate these directly by adding these numbers together, then dividing by two. So if you don't like doing it sort of mentally, just add these numbers together and then half them on your calculator. The next one, halfway between these two, would be 145. Halfway between these two would be 155. Then 165. Finally, 175. So what we're plotting here is the midpoints versus the frequencies. So the first one is 135 along and up to 4. So this one is going to be here. Then 145 and up to 11 would be over here, 155 and up to 24 would be this point, and along to 165 and up to 22, that's going to be here, and the last one, 175 along and 19 up would be this point here. Now finally what we need to do is you draw them from dot to dot with a straight line and that's us doing the frequency polygon. So that's the first line, then this one, then to there, and finally down to there. And that's frequency polygon and that concludes question one. So let's now have a look at question number two. So here's question two. So this is a question about fuel prices. So we're going to compare London prices versus New York, New York prices. So we're told in London, one litre costs 108.9 pence, but in New York, one US gallon of petrol costs $2.83. We're 
We're given some conversions here to work with as well. Both these are ratios of a type 1 to n. The first number is a 1, the second number is not a 1. And we need to work out in which city is it better value for money, London or New York. You must show your work and you can't just guess one or the other and get full marks. That would be a bit too easy. I think you'd probably begrudgingly agree with me there. There's two main ways of doing it. We can do it in UK units or we can compare using US units. As long as we're comparing consistent units, either way is good. So I'm going to show you two methods here for this one. So the first method I'm going to show you is what if we converted everything into litres and pounds? So based off that, let's change the New York data. So for New York, what we're told here is that one US gallon costs $2.83. So I'm just going to write that down first of all. One gallon, that costs $2.83. Now I'm going to change it step by step so it gets into litres and pounds. Well, how much is a gallon? Well, it says here that one US gallon is 3.785 litres. So that's the first thing I can change straight away. I'm just going to rewrite this as 3.785 litres. So I haven't really done anything yet, but I've made it closer to litres and pounds by changing this to litres at least. Now, the money. $2.83. I need to change this into pounds. What we're told here is that one pound is $1.46. And because this is in a ratio of a type 1 to n, what it means is to change from the smaller value into the bigger looking value, you just multiply by 1.46. Therefore, going the other way around, to change from dollars back into pounds, we're going from a bigger number to a smaller number. We need to divide by 1.46. So if I divide this price by 1.46, that'll get it into pounds for me. So that's what I'm going to do first. So $2.83 divided by 1.46. That gives us, in pounds, 1.93835 roughly. And if you're thinking, but you can't actually have that number of pounds and pence, I know, we can round off at the end, but not yet. So 1.93836, I'll call it. Like I say, I can round it off to a better looking answer later on. And that's 3.785 litres. However, I want the price of just one litre. So what I could do to both sides of this relation is to divide by 3.785. And that'll change it into a price for just one litre which is what I want to do, because I could compare that price for one litre here in New York to the price of one litre in London, UK. So one litre is going to be this number here, divided by 3.785. So divide by 3.785. So that to the nearest cent is 51, sorry, to the nearest pound I need to say, that's about 51 pence. I'm talking in pounds now, so 51 pence or 0.51. So in other words, in New York, one litre is 51 pence, whereas in the UK, it's over a pound. So it's literally more than double the price in London. Therefore, it's much cheaper per litre in New York. So we just conclude by saying, therefore, New York is better value for money. Because importantly, uh, 51 pence here is obviously cheaper than 108.9 pence in London. So that's one way of doing it. What we could have done instead is to convert to US gallons and dollars. So let's imagine you wanted to do that for London. So let's compare in terms of US prices. So in London, we have one litre 
costs 108.9 pence. Now I'm going to just write this in terms of pounds. One pound, 8p, plus 9 tenths of a penny. So first of all, what we can do is we can compare this to gallons by multiplying by 3.785, because we have 3.785 litres to every one gallon. So that's what we can do next. Just multiply both sides by 3.785. And if we do that, then we're going to get 3.785 litres. And now we need to multiply this price by 3.785 to keep the balance correct. So 1.089 multiplied by 3.785 that gives us a price of approximately four pounds 12. I'm going to put four pounds 12 an extra one nine. Again I don't need to round quite yet so it doesn't do any harm to just give it an, an answer which is slightly more accurate. So 4.1219. Is that correct? Yes. So one gallon is 3.785 so i'm just going to call this one gallon now just to make it clear what i'm talking about so one gallon equals four pounds 12. and all i've done there is shown that i know that 3.785 is one gallon based on what this question tells us however what we need here is to convert the price into dollars because in new york it's one gallon given as a certain number of dollars, namely $2.83. Now, if you cast your mind back when I converted from dollars to pounds, we divided by 1.46. But if I'm going the other way around from pounds to dollars, I'm going from a smaller looking number to a bigger looking number. So instead of dividing, because I'm going the opposite way around, I do the opposite thing. I need to multiply by 1.46. So to go from pounds to dollars times that by 1.46 and then I'll work out how much each gallon is in terms of dollars equivalent in the UK well London to be particular so this number here times 1.46 gives us six dollars and two cents roughly so to the nearest cent that's six dollars and two cents. Whereas actually in New York, it's only two dollars 83. In London, the equivalent is more than six dollars. So again, via a different way, we've shown that it's more than double the price equivalently in London than what it would be in New York. So again, it'd be the same conclusion. Therefore, we're just saying New York is better value for money. So obviously only just do one method in your exam. I'm just showing you two ways here in case you weren't sure which way to go, I'm just trying to show you that actually either way will be absolutely fine and completely valid. So that's question two. Next, question three. We're talking about density, mass and volume. So a gold bar has a mass of 12.5 kilograms and the density of gold is 19.3 grams per cubic centimetre. Work out the volume of gold bar, give your answer to three significant figures. For this one, we need to remember how density, mass and volume relate, and it's that density equals mass divided by volume, which you could remember using this magic triangle here. So density equals mass over volume. Now, before we move on, just have a look at these units first of all, and you probably could tell me what the problem is here. I'm just going to get my magic hand to cover up what I want to work out. So here's my little magic hand. I want to work out the volume, so because I want to work out the volume, all I need to do here is to cover up volume. Volume is mass divided by density, as you can see, there are only two things left, mass on top, density on the bottom, therefore V equals M over D. Could it be this easy? Maybe, but actually there's a slight trick here, like I said, look at the units. These units are not consistent. What we need to do is make them consistent. And what I'd say would be a good thing to remember is that one kilo equals 1,000 grams. 
5k means a thousand. If you won 5k on the lottery, people would understand that that meant 5,000 pounds. So k, think about as denoting a thousand. So what I could do here is change this 12.5 kilograms into grams by multiplying it by 1,000. And if we do that, we'd get 12,500 grams. Now the units are consistent, I'm talking grams in each, so now I can proceed. So I know the mass now, in terms of consistent units, is 12,500. So I just put that number in. Whereas the volume, sorry, the density, I mean to say, is 19.3 grams per cubic centimetre. So I just plug this in underneath. Now I just work them out. So let's see what this gives us. So 12,500 divided by 19.3. I'm going to give the answer to three significant figures. So 6, 4, 7, 1, 2, 3 significant figures. However, after the 7 is a 6, that 6 is higher than a 5, well it's 5 or higher, so that 7 is forced to round up to an 8. So we're going to have 6, 4, 8 grams. And that's our answer to three significant figures. So that's all we need to do. Question four, we're talking about ratio this time. So there are only blue, green and red pens in a box. The ratio of a number of blue to green is 2.5. Dot, dot, then it says the ratio of the green to the red is 4.1. Dot, dot, there are less than 100 pens in the box. What's the greatest possible number of red pens in the box? So. There's quite a few different things going off here, so what I'd always suggest is to try and simplify and order this information in a ratio table. So something like this should do the trick quite nicely. So first of all, we're told about blue to green. We're told that for every blue, for every two blue, I mean to say, there's five green pens. So blue to green is two dot dot five. Or whereas on this next bit we're told the ratio of green to red is four to one. So for every four green pens there's only one that's red. So I'll put this on a different line here. Four to one. Now green are mentioned in both ratios but these numbers aren't the same. So I could get this onto one line where I can compare blue, green and red together if I could get these number of greens to be the same. So I've got five parts of green on one line, four parts of green on the other. So what number is in the five times table and in the four times table? Well the answer to that is 20. I can get both of these to be 20 green I can multiply this top line here, for example, by 4. So if I just multiply through this top one by 4, and just write it down here, then that gives me 8 blue, 5 times 4, 20 green. And this one here, the second line, the 4 and 1, to get 4 to 20, I could multiply this middle row here by 5. So if I times this one by 5, and write it down below, 4 times 5 gives me 20, obviously, and then 1 times 5 gives me 5. So the ratio of blue to green to red is actually 8 dot dot 20 dot dot 5. 8 plus 20 plus 5 gives a total of 33. So if there were, for example, 8 blue and 20 green and 5 red, that would only be a total of 33 um, pens in the box. We're told there's less than 100, then we want to work out the greatest possible number of red pens in the box. So our total, we need to keep below 100, but we want the greatest possible number of red pens without this total exceeding 100. So how close to 100 can we get this total without going over it. Well, 3 times 33 is 99, and that's as close as we can go. So what we could do here 
is we could multiply this row by 3. And then we'd almost have 100 pens, but not quite, which is what we're wanting. We're wanting as close to 100 without going over, so we can maximise the number of reds. So multiply all these values here by 3. That gives us 99. 5 times 3 is 15. 20 times 3 is 60. And 8 times 3 is 24. But importantly, we're only interested in the greatest possible number of red pens in the box, which hopefully, as you can see here, that's going to give us 15. So the greatest number of red pens in this box is 15. And there we have it. Let's look at question five. Question five, it says a value of a reciprocal, oh sorry, find the value of a reciprocal of 1.6. Give your answer as a decimal. I'll show you how to do reciprocal in terms of understanding, and then I'll show you a quick way how your calculator can do it for you. So first of all, we can say 1.6 is the same as 1.6 over 1. Okay, I can write anything over 1 and it stays as itself. That means 1.6 divided by 1, which is just 1.6. Now, the reciprocal of any number, in this case, reciprocal of 1.6, is just its fraction form turned upside down. So, reciprocal of 1.6 is, I'm going to flip that 1 to bring it to the top, and that 1.6 I flip and bring it to the bottom. So the reciprocal is 1 over 1.6, which you see there is 5 eighths. But as a decimal, read the question carefully, press S arrow D, we get 0.625. Now the reciprocal of a value is essentially just that value to the power minus 1. So if there is a reciprocal button on your calculator, it's the button that gives anything to the power minus 1. So to reciprocate a value, type in the value and press this button here and press equals. And there you have it, SROD to get it as a decimal, exactly what we had before. Next question, question 5 is about error intervals. So Jess rounds a number x to one decimal place, she gets 9.8. Write down the error interval for x. So, essentially, it used to be a number, could have been a really awkward number of lots of decimal places. It's been rounded about to one decimal place to 9.8. So if you imagine a number line accurate to one decimal place, so it goes 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and so on, then her number must have been quite close to 9.8. So we can imagine it like this. It's been rounded to 9.8, which has been highlighted here. What's the smallest value it could have been? that would have still rounded up to 9.8 to one decimal place. But I'd actually be halfway in between 9.7 and 9.8, which would be 9.75. On the other hand, the absolute limit, the cutoff in between this value rounding down to 9.8 versus rounding up to 9.9, .9, that boundary would have been 9.85. So if the upper bound is 9.85, the lower bound is 9.75. That's all the error of interval is. If you round into decimal places or significant figures, you just stick a 5 on the end, and the lower bound looks the same, but whatever comes before the 5 is just one less. So 9, 8, 9, 7. So there are quick ways of doing these with practice. So the error interval, we just write down 9.75. Now it's allowed to be 9.75 because if it were 9.75, that would round up to 9.8. However, you're probably thinking, but if it were 9.85, it would have rounded up to 9.9. .9. Yes, it would, which is why we say that the absolute limit, x can be as close as you like to 9.85, but strictly speaking, must just be a smidgen less. Because if it wasn't, if it were 9.85, it would round up. So we get round that by just putting this inequality symbol here, to mean that it strictly has to be less than 9.85, but on this end it is allowed to be 9.75. Let's have a look at the next question. Question 6, there's a rectangle, and we're told that for this rectangle, the length of it 
is seven centimeters more than the width of it. Four of these rectangles are used to make this eight-sided shape below. Looks like a, an S, really. You're told the perimeter of it is 70 centimeters, and now what we need to do is to work out the area of that eight-sided shape. So let's just split this down into smaller steps. As you can see here, these are put together and they overlap. So I'm just going to look at two of these which overlap and we can focus in on it. So just looking at this here. Now we're told about the width of the rectangle. So the width, let's just label on the width. The width is, as you should know, smaller than the length. The width is just going to be these sides here. So for this shape, or the portion of a shape, I'm just going to label on the widths. So those are the widths, I'm just going to call those W. It now says that the length of the rectangle is seven centimetres longer than the width. So if the width is W, how could I write down seven centimetres longer than W? Well, that would just be W plus an extra seven. So these lengths here, there and there, I'm just going to label as W plus seven. In other words, seven centimetres more than the width. Now, the final thing to consider is what about this tiny length here? Well, from one end to the other is the full width, sorry, the full length from that point to that point is the full length, which is W plus 7. However, from here to here, that's W. So this bit from there to there must be the extra 7 because W plus 7 there would give us W plus 7, which is what it actually is. So we need to label this here 7. Now I've got all my parts which can now label on on this shape here. The perimeter is just the outside, so only these outside edges are the ones I need to label like so. So I'm just going to label the widths first of all. So in red, on the outside of the shape, on the perimeter, I've got four widths, four Ws. I've also got four lengths to label on. The length is a width plus 7, so I've labelled four lots of W plus 7. That's almost the entire outside of a shape done now. But you can see here, I've got this bit and that bit, which are both 7s, like we discussed before. So that now is the full perimeter. So what do we have? Well, looking at the red Ws, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's four Ws. Then I've got some blue W's as well. One, two, three, four. So I'm going to add on an extra four W's, wrong colour. Also the blue sevens, I've got one, two, three, four. So that's seven, 14, 21, 28. And also these green ones, seven plus another seven is 14. That's the full perimeter, that's the whole length around the outside of the shape. So that is the perimeter, but we're told the perimeter is 70. So this here must add up to 70. So now we can simplify this. So I've got 4w plus 4w, that gives 8w. 28 plus 14 is 42. So 8w plus 42 is 70. If I take away 42 from both sides to get the w's on its own, that give me the 8w's equals 40, sorry, 70, take away 42, which is 28. Then finally, to go from 8w's down to just 1w, I can divide both sides by 8. And if we do that, 28 divided by 8 is 3.5. So W is 3.5. In other words, the width is 3.5 centimetres. Therefore, the length, which is 7 centimetres more than the width, the length must be 7 plus 3.5, which obviously is 10.5.
But this question is actually asking us about the area of the eight-sided shape. So this shape is made up of four of these rectangles. That's one rectangle, second, third and fourth. So it's four rectangles put together. Now I know the length and the width of one of them, I can work out the area of one of these rectangles. So how do you work out the area of a rectangle or a square? You know this, I'm sure. It's the length times the width. So for one of them, 10.5 times 3.5 will tell me the area. So let's work out that. 10.5 multiplied by 3.5. That gives an area of 36.75 centimetres squared. Therefore, for the full shape, which is four of these rectangles, I need to do four times 36.75. So four times 36.75, and then I've got it. So just calculate that. Four times 36.75 gives us a total area of 147 cm squared. Number seven, standard form. Work out 13.8 times 10 to the 7 multiplied by 5.4 times 10 to the negative 12. Give your answer as an ordinary number. So I'll just show how to do this using the calculator. Now, I'd always suggest a Casio. I'm Casio biased. I can't really fault the Casio much. I'm not been given any money by Casio to say that. I just think they're very easy. But anyway, using a calculator, I'd suggest a Casio. Just type this in exactly as it looks. So put brackets. You got 13.8 multiplied by 10, power button 7, close brackets because it has there, and multiply by, open brackets, 5.4 times 10 to the power minus 12, and finally close brackets, we get this, 7.452 times 10 to the minus 4. That's an answer given in standard form. If you've got a calculator that gives you a answer as a decimal, great. If you're wondering, how can I get my calculator to give me an answer as a decimal rather than this? I'll show you in a second. Sometimes pressing SROD doesn't work, you see. Anyway, I'll explain how to write it down as an ordinary number. If it's a power of 10, which is negative, this is 10 to the negative 4, the number after the negative tells us how many zeros we need to write down before the first non-zero number which in this case is a seven because it's minus four we need four zeros first so one put the dot two three four and if we go back and just write seven four five two and that's our answer now to take the guesswork out to give you an answer on your calculator straight away in this nice form, what you can do is press shift menu, go to number format, option three, press three for normal mode, but then press option two. For some reason, I think option two is better. It will allow you to convert an answer to a decimal rather than forcing an answer into standard form. So if I press two, now if I press SROD, it will give you the answer you need straight away. 0.0007452, which is what we said it was. Okay, so shift menu, normal two, you might found to be an easier mode for you in your exams. Anyway, that's a little detour about how to use your calculator. Let's just crack on now and have a look at the next question. Question eight is about probability. So when a drawing pin is dropped, it can land either point down or point up. Lucy, Mel and Tom each dropped the drawing pin a number of times as shown in the table. So it shows how many times it landed point down and point up for each of these three people. Rachel is going to drop the drawing pin once, whose results will give the best estimate for the probability that the drawing pin will land point up. Give a reason for your answer. One of the basic rules of probability is the more times you repeat an experiment, the more reliable your data will be. 
So in terms of who's got the better results to base an estimate off, it's simply going to be the person who's had more drops of this drawing pin. And you can see here Mel's dropped it more often than the others. Mel's dropped it a grand total of, as you can see here, 80 times. Tom only 25, Lucy only 45. So Mel's dropped it more often. So we just say something along these lines. Mel's results will give the best estimate because she has dropped the pin the most times. Simple as. Now for part B, it says about Stuart. So Stuart's going to drop the drawing pin twice, use all the results in the table to work out an estimate for the probability that the drawing pin will land point up for the first time and point down for the second time. So what we need to do is add up all of these results. So the total that it landed down, the total that it landed up. So if we add these numbers together, 31 plus 53 plus 16 gives 100. And the total up, if you added these up, would be 50. So therefore, down, probability of it landing down, is best estimated by the total number of times it landed on a down, which is 100, out of a total number of throws. 100 plus 50 is 150. So in other words, this will simplify to two thirds. So two out of every three throws, it landed down. And the probability of it landing up, based off this data, would be the relative frequency of it landing up. It landed on up 50 out of 150 times, which simplifies down to one third. So this is what we're going to base our estimate of this probability off for part B. So for part B, to work out the probability that it lands first of all up and then down, we need to work out probability of up and then down. Now, if you're thinking, why is he writing and then really angrily in red? It's because if you have a probability question and you almost need to use the word and or and then, the and implies it's going to be a multiplicative relationship. In other words, one probability multiplied by the other. If it was up or down, that would imply it's an add. The word and though implies we multiply. So we multiply the probability of landing on up, which is one third, and multiply that by the probability of landing down, which is two thirds. So these probabilities are coming from that one and probability landing down, which is two thirds. So that's where the numbers are coming from, just so you can keep up with where I'm going with this, hopefully. So multiplying two fractions together, don't you calculate if you want to. In fact, I'd suggest that it's a calculator paper, but one times two is two, three times three is nine. So it's two ninths and we're done. Question nine, we're talking about Jack's boat. So Jack bought a new boat for twelve and a half thousand pounds. Lucky him. The value, V pounds, of Jack's boat at the end of N years are given by the formula V equals 12,500 multiplied by 0 0.85 to the power N. So for part A, we're asked at the end of how many years was the value of Jack's boat first less than 50% of the value of a boat when it was new? So all it's saying here is how long does it take for the value of it to more than half? So what is half of the value of the boat? So half of 12,500, if we just do 12,500 divided by 2, I'd get there that it's 6,250. So it's saying after how many years does a value first go lower than 6,250? Well, for this one, we just essentially use guesswork. We can do this very quickly on the calculator. So what we're going to do here is we get the calculator, and we type this in exactly as it looks. So 12,500 multiplied by 0 0.85 to the power of how many years? How many years will it take? Honestly, I don't know. 
So we just guess. We just try numbers, and assuming you've got a fairly quick finger to type in these answers quickly, you can do this in seconds. So is it going to be one year it takes? No. After one year, it's still worth more than £10,000. So it's still well over £6,250. Let's go back and try two. No, 9,000, not low enough. Toggle back, try three years. 7,600 and something, still worth too much. Go back, try four years. Getting very close now, but it's still over 6,250. That's still more than half of its initial value. Therefore, if I try five years, aha, now it is less than 50%. So it takes five years for the value to dip below than 50% of its original. So that one, we just simply need to put five years. For part B, a savings account pays interest at a rate of R% per year. Jack invests 5,500 5, in the account for one year, and at the end of the year, Jack pays tax on the interest at a rate of 40%. After paying tax, he gets £79.20. Work out the value of R. Now in this question, I'm going to work backwards. So I'm going to look, first of all, at this information here. So he gets charged 40% on the interest he gets. So after paying tax, he gets £79.20. So what this means is, after he pays 40%, 60% remains for him. So £79.20 must be 60% of his interest. So we can conclude that 60% of the interest he got, in other words, all the interest he got minus the 40% he got taxed on it, is £79.20. From there, I can work out what the total interest he got was, which is 100% of the interest. First of all, I'd suggest we can work out what 1% of the interest is. To go from 60% down to just 1%, I can divide by 60. And if I do that to the left-hand side, I must do it to the right-hand side as well, to keep the numbers in the correct proportion. So £79.20 divided by 60, That gives £1.32. Then to go from 1% to 100%, in other words, the full interest, I just multiply both sides by 100. So therefore, total interest this times 100 would give £132. So, he got £132 out of a total of £5,500 he invested. So, the interest as a fraction of the investment we can work out easily. We can just write the interest as the numerator and the total investment, 5,500, as the denominator. So he got £132 interest out of a total of 5,500. So 132 out of 5,500, he got 325 fifths. So therefore, this is the fractional interest. We want to work out percentage interest. Now to go from a fraction to a percentage, you should hopefully remember, we need to multiply by 100. So that figure times 100 is 2.4%. So 
So what does the question say? It says he pays interest at a rate of R percent. The interest is 2.4 percent, so therefore R must be 2.4. So we just conclude with reference to the actual question. So therefore, answer the question as it's written, R equals 2.4. And then, only now we're done. R is 2.4. Let's have a look at number 10 now. Number 10. There are only blue, yellow, and green, and red counters in a bag. So a counter is taken at random from the bag. The table shows the probabilities of getting a blue counter, or a yellow, or a green. Work out the probability of getting a red counter. Well, we need to know that the sum of all possible probabilities for any given event always needs to add up to 1. So here, 0 0.2 plus 0.35 plus 0.4 plus the number of red, which we'll just call R, needs to add up to 1. So, so far, we've got 0 0.2 plus 0.35 plus 0.4. That gives me a total of 0.95. So 0 0.95 plus R equals 1. Therefore, R would just be 1 minus 0 0.95, which is 0 0.05. So this figure here is going to be 0 0.05. Next, it says, what's the least possible number of counters in the bag? You must give a reason for your answer. So these probabilities here relate to the proportion of counters in the bag. So 5% of counters are red, 40% are green, and so on. So what we need to do here is go from these probabilities to working out the total numbers of counters. So obviously, the, whole, the number of counters has to be a whole number. So what's the smallest number we could multiply all of these probabilities by to convert all these probabilities into whole numbers? Well, obviously, the smallest number of counters we could have for red is going to be 1. And I'm focusing on red because that's the smallest probability. Obviously, we've got to be at least one red counter because there is a probability of getting a red counter. So what's the smallest number I could multiply 0 0.05 by to get a whole number, in other words, 1. Well, I can find this out by doing 1 divided by 0 0.05, which gives 20. So as a bare minimum, I'd have to multiply all these figures here by 20. And if I did that, these 0 0.2 blues, that would change into 4 blues. For yellows, 0.35, that would change into 7 yellows. I'm not going to do a yellow font, it's quite hard to read on a screen. 0.4 times 2 for green, that would give 8. And 0.05 times 20, that would give 1. So if I total all these up here, I'd get 4 plus 7 plus 8 plus 1. And that gives a total of 20 counters. And the reason for that is because there's got to be at least one red counter. So reason there must be at least one red counter. Could have also said that these numbers here, the number of counters, must all be whole numbers. That would have been an alternative way of getting yourself that mark awarded as well. But ultimately, there needs to be at least one red counter. So I needed to multiply this by at least 20. I couldn't have multiplied it by anything less. So times all of these by 20. That's why I get a total of a minimum of at least 20. So that's number 10 sorted out. 
On number 11, we've got a cumulative frequency graph, and it shows information about the weights of 60 potatoes. So we need to use a graph to find an estimate for the median weight. So the clue here is we've been told how many potatoes there are. So median means the middle one. So the median potato would be 60 divided by 2. So the median would be 60 divided by 2. So that'll be the 30th potato, essentially. So what we need to do is use the cumulative frequency axis, the y-axis, read off at 30 until we hit the curve, then read down, then read off at what weight that gives us. So using a ruler, read along at 30, then down, you should see that the median weight is 57 grams. So importantly, showing the lines on the diagram is evidence of working in itself. So do show these lines on your diagram to the examiner. And that's 57 kilograms. So we just fill this in and then we're good to go on to part B. So for part B, it's about Jamil saying about what he thinks the range is. So Jamil is saying 80 minus 40 equals 40. So the range of weights is 40 grams. So what he's done here, at least what I think we're meant to think he's done, is he's read off at 80 as like the maximum point there. And then he's read off at 40, which is the minimum down there. So he's on the range's absolute biggest, take absolute smallest. So is he correct? Well, actually not necessarily. With cumulative frequency, you're given boundaries for where the weights might lie. So here it ends at 80, which tells us that the maximum possible weight, for example, between 70 and 80, was so many potatoes. But it's not saying that necessarily any one potato weighed exactly 80 grams. All this is saying is that 80 grams was the absolute maximum many of these potatoes were. In a similar way, 40 grams is the absolute minimum. So we need to say something like this, really. So essentially, he may be incorrect because the lightest potato may have been heavier than 40 grams and the heaviest may have been lighter than 80 grams. Now, part C, you have to show that less than 25% of the potatoes have a weight greater than 65 grams. So for this one, what we can do is we can go to 65 and then read up and along and see how many potatoes that would be. So what we get here is we'd go up to this point then go across and we'd see here it should be between 48 and 49. So just above this line is the 49th potato. OK, so from 60 to 49 and this in itself is working of the method. 60 take away 49. That gives us 11 potatoes, which are above 65 grams. Now, 11 potatoes out of a total of 60, we can work this out as a percentage. So 11 out of 60, that's going to give us, well, let's see, 11 over 60 gives this times by 100. To change to a percentage, that gives about 18.3%. 18.3% is less than 25%. So because 18.3 is less than 25%, therefore less than 25% of them weigh more than 65 grams. And that's all we need to do. Question 12, a probability tree diagram. So Alan has two spinners, spinner A and spinner B. Each spinner can land only on red or on white. The probability that spinner A will land on red is 0.25, hence the 0.75 chance of landing on white. And for B, the chance that spinner B will land on red is 0.6, therefore the chance of it landing on white is 0.4. So he spins spinner A once, and then the second spinner, spinner B once as well. He does this quite a few times, apparently. The number of times 
both spinners land on red is 24. We need to work out an estimate for the number of times both spinners land on white. Well, both spinners land on red being 24 times. Well, how likely was that to happen? Well, we can work this out directly using the tree diagram. So what's the probability of getting red and then red again? So red and then red again. I've put and then in block capitals because if we use and in probability, it will usually imply we multiply the probabilities, which is what we do here. We take the probability of getting red on spinner A, which is 0 0.25, and then we multiply that by the probability of getting red on spinner B. The chance of getting red on spinner B is 0 0.6. So 0 0.25 times 0 0.6, if we work this out, we'll see what this comes to. So 0 0.25 times 0 0.6, that gives us a probability of 0.15. So 15% chance of getting a red and then another red. So we just need to write this in, that's a 0 0.15 chance. Now, we can now do the same for the chance that both landed on white, but we could compare this 24 to how many times it would have likely landed on white both times. What's the probability of white and then white? So again, because it's white both times, we're going to multiply both probabilities together. So if we do that, what we're going to get is probability of spinner A being white is 0 0.75. Then we multiply that by the probability of spinner B landing on white, which is 0 0.4. So I wonder what 0 0.75 times 0 0.4 is. Again, if you use your calculator, which I definitely recommend because it's a calculator paper, of course, 0 0.75 times 0 0.4, that gives us 0 0.3. So now, importantly, it's about comparing these two probabilities together. 0.3 I can think of as 0.30. So if these spinners both landed on red 24 times, how many times would we guess they'd both land on white if a probability of landing on white is 0.30 compared to 0.15 landing on red? Well, if a 15% chance led to them both landing on red 24 times, Compare 0.15 to 0 0.30. 0 0.30 is twice as large, therefore the chance of it landing white and white again is double. So essentially, because this is double the probability, we would understandably expect double the number of times that it lands on white and white. So double 24 is 48. So we'd expect it to land both on white a total of 48 times. Question 13. We're asked to write x squared plus 6x minus 7 in the form x plus a all squared plus b, where a and b are integers. An integer is just a whole number that is allowed to be a minus. Now this is a more complicated way of just asking you to complete the square on this bit here. So all we need to do, if you remember to complete the square, make sure the coefficient in front of the x squared is just one. We do have just a single x squared there, so we're good to go as it is. Now what we do, in brackets, we replace the x squared with an x, and we half the number in front of a normal x here. So in front of a normal x, the coefficient is a positive six, half of plus six is plus three. We square that, and then we always subtract, it's always a minus here, always, 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 we subtract this thing here, squared. So we're going to subtract 3 squared. If this were minus 3, we'd still subtract 3 squared, we'd still subtract 9. So the main thing is, we rewrite this bit like so, in completed square form, like so. Then that minus 7, we just tag on the end as well. 
So overall, we've got x plus 3 all squared. Minus 3 squared means minus 9. So minus 9 minus another 7, that's minus 16. So our final answer to that one is x plus 3 all squared minus 16. Question 14, we've got two cones, cone A and cone B. We're told these are mathematically similar. The ratio of volume of cone A to the volume of cone B is 27 dot dot 8. So if two shapes are mathematically similar, their length ratios and area ratios and volume ratios will all link together. So I'm just going to explain that now. So what do we have so far? Well, we're told the volume of A to the volume of B is 27 dot dot 8. So if I have A over here and B there, then the volume ratios are 27 dot dot 8. Now, we always want to start, if we can, thinking about the linear ratios, the ratios of the lengths of the shapes, the ratio of the heights, the ratio of their depths, and so on. So volume is given in terms of cubic units. Okay, so this is like centimetres cubed or metres cubed. Linear is just centimetres to the power one, just centimetres, or metres to the power one, just metres. So we need to do the opposite of cubing something, and that is to cube root both values. So both values in this ratio, we cube root. So how to cube root 27, I'll show you. So we do shift, press this button here and press three. You should really know this mentally, but if you've forgotten, it's okay. It is a calculator paper. So essentially it's what number when you times it by itself three times gives us 27, that number is going to be three. And in the same way, what number times itself three times gives us eight, that's going to be two. Once we've got that, we can work out the area ratio. Area, it, we're talking about square units. So we take the linear and we can square both values. So square three gives us nine. And if we square two, that gives us four. So for this question, because we're asking about surface areas, we can focus in on the area ratio. So the area ratio is nine dot dot four. Where this is shape A and that's shape B. So we're told now that the surface area of cone A is 297. So these nine parts of surface area for A must be worth 297. So what would we have had to multiply by to go from 9 up to 297? Well, we can work out how many times bigger this number is for 9 by doing 297 divided by 9. So 297 divided by 9, that gives us 33. So we'd have to multiply that by 33. Therefore, to keep this ratio equivalent, we'd also need to multiply this 4 by 33 as well. And if we do that and check what 4 times 33 is, lo and behold, it's 132, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So therefore, surface area of B must be 132 cm squared. So this table and these ratios are your working. You can't just fluff it and say it must be 132 cm squared. It needs to be backed up with clear, robust working. Question 15 is about iteration formulae. So first of all, and these questions are often quite formulaic in terms of they'll have a certain structure to them. So once you've seen a few, you've effectively seen them all. So part A is a typical part A for these types of questions. Show that x cubed plus 7x minus 5 equals 0 has a solution in between when x is 0 and x is 1. So what we do here is we just check both values of x. So first of all, we check when x is 0. So when x equals 0, what will this give us? Well, x cubed is just 0 cubed. 
7 lots of x means 7 lots of 0. For minus 5, that's just going to give us minus 5, because 0 cubed is nothing. 7 times 0 is still nothing. Minus 5 gives us minus 5. We now try the same thing when x is 1. So when x is 1, x cubed becomes 1 cubed now. Plus 7x means plus 7 lots of 1. Minus 5 is obviously just minus 5. Now that 1 cubed is 1, 7 times 1 is 7, 1 plus 7 is 8, 8 minus 5 is 3. Importantly, we need to pay attention to the signs. So this minus 5 here is obviously a negative value, whereas 3 is a positive value. So we conclude by saying, therefore, there is a solution in between x equals 0 and x equals 1. Now this is a key thing, it's because there is a change of sign. It goes from being negative to positive. So the important thing is to say there's a change of sign between when x is 0 and x is 1. It could have gone from positive to negative as well, as long as it changes sign in between the two values. That shows that it must be exactly zero between them at some point. Part B, we need to show that the equation x cubed plus 7x minus 5 equals zero can be rearranged into this form. So that's our target. We want to show that this is the same as this thing here. So if you notice, this 5 has gone to the other side of the equals sign. So as a first step, we can do that. So I'm going to start with x cubed plus 7x minus 5 equals 0. And the first step is we can just add 5 to both sides. So if we do that, we just get x cubed plus 7x equals 5. Now we've got x's in both terms. So because of that, we can factorise out an x from each of these terms. That gives us x brackets x squared plus 7 equals 5. Finally, we can divide both sides of this by x squared plus 7. We then get x equals 5 divided by x squared plus 7, which is exactly what we wanted to prove all along, so that's exactly the same as our target. So we've done it. Now part C, this is where people can get quite confused because of the terminology. X subscript 0 just means your starting value of X. So your starting value of X is 1. This iteration formula, which just means we're going to put in values again and again in like a cyclic way, this will generate an increasingly accurate approximation to this equation. So what this is saying is the next x estimate you're going to get is 5 divided by your previous x estimate plus 7. So we know x 0, so x n plus 1, our first one will be x 1. We need to do this three times, so I'll show you this step by step. So x 1 will be 5 divided by x 0 squared plus 7. So that's going to be 5 divided by, well x 0 is 1, so that's going to be 5 divided by 1 squared plus 7. And that will give you 5 eighths. So all we're done here is use the idea that x 0 is 1. So that's why we've put 1 there. So that's the first iteration. The second one, 
is going to be x2. So x2 is going to be 5, just like before, divided by the x immediately before it's squared. So 1 before the second x was x1. So I'm going to do x1 squared next, plus 7. That's going to be 5 divided by what x1 was. But we worked out that x1 is 5 eighths. So that's the value we're going to use now for x1. So it's going to be 5 eighths all squared. Plus 7. So this I definitely need a calculator for. So let's see what this gives us. So we need to type in on top 5, on the bottom 5 eighths squared. So then put the bracket in. Fraction 5 over 8, close bracket, squared, and then plus 7. Then what we get there, which we can leave in fraction form if you want to, is 320 over 473. So that's what we need to type in next, 320 over 473. And that's the second value from the iteration. So we've iterated twice. So now what we need to do is just do it one more time. So then based off this one, we can work out x3. So then x3 will be 5 over this thing here squared. So it gets a bit more awkward. So 320 over 473 squared. Again, plus 7. So now if we try that one, and I'll show you the quick way in just a moment. So 5, then over, type brackets. It was 320 over 473, if I remembered correctly. I'll just double check that, because obviously I don't want to type in the wrong number. And plus 7, yes. So then press equals, you get 0 0.670448301. And that's our answer to part C, essentially. So 670-4483-001. don't need to round it, you could if you want to. But you're not going to be penalised if you leave it in its full form. Now, I did mention a way which is much nicer and easier and less likely for you to type in errors when you're putting the long numbers in on your calculator by using the calculator's ANS function. So I'm just going to show you how you could have arrived at that much quicker, actually. And once you get confident using this function, it will save you lots of time. So if you just bear with me, I'll just show you the full question again, done in an easier way. So let's imagine we go back to working out x1, the first value of x. So that was 5 over 1 squared, if you remember, plus 7. Then you get this answer. Now, what you're doing each time with an iteration formula is using your previous answer to work out the next value. So our next answer is based off updating this value here squared. So that 1 squared we now need to put as 5 eighths, which is our current answer. So what we can do now is use this equation we've already got, alter it by toggling on the calculator, press delete and just put in the previous answer squared. So then you get 320 over 473 much quicker. Then the next answer, just press equals again. Don't need to press anything, just press equals again, and then it updates to the next one. If you wanted a fourth iteration, just press equals again. A fifth one, keep pressing equals and equals. So that's a much quicker way of getting it. Anyway, like I said, part C is 0 0.670. Now for part D, it says by substituting in your answer to part C, this one here, into x cubed plus 7x minus 5, comment on the accuracy of your estimate to the solution to x cubed plus 7x minus 5 equals 0. What this is saying is, if this approximation here, this 0 0.670, is pretty decent, then if we put it into here, if it were exact, it would be exactly equal to 0. But because it's an estimate, it should be somewhere near to 0, and the closer it is to 0 when we plug in this for x, the better the approximation is. So we're going to use x as 0 0.670 and plug it in to this formula here. So my answer is stored as that. 
So x cubed, I can just do that answer cubed, plus 7 lots of x, 7 lots of that stored answer, minus 5. So I just need to put what this is going to be equal to. The closer it is to 0, the better. So let's see what it is. Press equals. Minus 0 0.005. 0 point anything means it's very close to 0. So that's very accurate indeed, because that's very close to 0. And so in terms of what we write for D, we need to write evidence that we've substituted in this value from part C into this formula, and then we make a comment based on our answer to say, therefore, yes, the estimate must be pretty accurate. So here's an idea of what you might want to write, something like this. If using x2 from part C for x gives 0 0.6704, I've put dots on here to just show that this is roughly what it is, that cubed plus 7 lots of x minus 5 gave us this value here, minus 0 0.00549. This is very close to zero, and so the estimate of x equals 0 0.6704 must be accurate. That's all we need to put to get full credit for 15d. Question 16. This is actually a bounds question, slightly disguised. So we've got the petrol consumption of a car in litres per 100 kilometres given by this formula here. Nathan's car travelled 148 kilometres, correct to three significant figures, and it used 11.8 litres of petrol, correct again to three significant figures. He's saying his car used less than eight litres of petrol per 100 kilometres. Could he be wrong? Show how you get your answer. Well, for this one, we need to consider bounds. So first of all, he's talking about how far his car travelled. So it's saying 148 kilometres, correct to three significant figures. So for that one, let's just consider bounds. So for this one, the distance, max, the upper bound for the distance, would be 148.5. That's the cutoff in between it rounding down to 148 and rounding up. So it can't be any higher than 148.5. That's the absolute limit it could have been. And the absolute lower boundary for the distance would be 147.5. That's the lowest the distance could have been with it still being able to round up to the 148, which it has. Any lower than that, it would have rounded to 147. And this is the absolute limit where it would just about round up. So those are the bounds for the distance. We now need to do the same for the petrol consumption. So it used 11.8 litres of petrol, correct, to three significant figures. So what we need to do here is boundaries for that as well. An upper bound and a lower bound. So the petrol usage, which I'm just going to call P for petrol. That spells pub. That's just a coincidence. Um, not got anything against or four pubs, but it spells pub. There you go. So anyway, upper bound for the Petrol usage would be 11.85. If you're not sure about these values, you need to just revise um, error intervals and bounds again. Then this will become more obvious to you. Uh, the lower bound for petrol usage, P lower bound, would be 11.75. So what we need to think about now is the consumption limits, the upper bound for consumption and the lower bound for consumption. So let's just think about the upper bound first. So the petrol consumption in terms of a upper bound, we can think of as follows. So consumption upper bound, we use this formula here. So it's 100 times what? Well, let's think about it. If we want to go for the maximum possible consumption, the biggest value, we want to maximise the value of this fraction. So to maximise the size of a fraction, we need to make the numerator as big as possible. So we're going to go for the upper bound of consumption. We're going to use the upper bound for litres of petrol used. So I'm going to go for the upper bound for petrol. And a fraction is bigger 
when the denominator is made to be smaller. So I'm going to choose the lower bound for number of kilometers traveled. So I'm going to go for distance lower bound here. So if we try that, we're going to get 100 multiplied by 11.85. And we're going to divide that by the lower bound of the distance, which is 147.5. So we try this. So we get 100 times 11.85 on the bottom 147.5. So press equals and convert to SROD to get it into a proper form. We get 8.03 to three significant figures. 8.03 and that's going to be litres per 100 kilometres. So 8.03 litres per 100k. So what we can do next is think about the lower bound for consumption. So to get the lower bound, we need to minimise the size of this fraction. So rather than choosing the biggest possible petrol usage, we go for the minimum possible petrol usage. So we take the lower bound for petrol usage and then to minimize a fraction, we maximize the denominator. So for kilometers traveled, we're going to go for the upper bound. We're going to go for D subscript UB. So that's going to give 100 multiplied by 11.75. And that's going to be divided by 148.5 this time. So if we try this and see what we get, so 100 multiplied by 11.75, all divided by 148.5, press equals and an SROD, we get about 7.91. So that gives 7.91 litres per 100 kilometres. So, therefore, his consumption is going to be a minimum of 7.91 litres per 100 kilometres, up to a maximum of 803, so 8.03 litres per 100 kilometres. So this is our take-home point. Now, Nathan's saying here his car used less than 8 litres of petrol per 100 kilometres. Could he be wrong? Well, he's going to be correct to the nearest litre, but actually, if you look here, his consumption could be 8.01 or 8.02. All we know for definite is the consumption's less than 8.03. So if his consumption was between 8 litres and 8.03, he could be wrong. So could Nathan be wrong? Yes, he could be wrong, is the answer. Yes, he could be wrong. And let's just make a little explanation of why he could be wrong. He could be wrong. Because the consumption could be as high as 8.03 almost. It could be as close as you like to 8.03 and that would be higher than 8 like he's saying. So if there's a small chance he could be wrong. Chances are he's probably right but maybe not. So that's the proof. We need to use bounds to prove why he could be wrong. And the important bound we need to go for 
is obviously the upper bound. So working out the upper bound is absolutely key there for doing question 16. Question 17, we've got two triangles glued together. They share a common side, AC. And it says here, the area of a triangle, ADC, the bottom triangle, is 56 square metres. Work out the length of AB, give your answer correct to one decimal place. Now, these are triangles and they're not right angled, so we're not going to be using standard trigonometry and we're not going to be using Pythagoras likely. So it's going to be more likely sine rule, cosine rule, and because we've got an area here for a non-standard right angle triangle, we might need to know the fancy area of a triangle formula, which relates to sine of an angle. So we need to remember these formulas ideally. These are the ones we're going to be using. So the first thing we're going to think about is the area of ADC. So how do you calculate the area of a triangle? Well, for this one here, we could use this formula. The area of a triangle is half times the two sides you do know, multiplied by sine of the angle in between them. So for ADC, I know this is 11, but I don't know this side here, so I'm just going to call this x. So now the area of a triangle, I could say it'd be half times 11 times x times sine of 105. And that would give me 56, because that's what it says it would be. So half times 11 times sine 105. Let's work out what this is. So we've got half multiplied by 11 multiplied by sine 105, close brackets. That gives this awful thing here, about 5.3125, 5.3125, and it carries on. So 5.3125, lots of x equals 56. So therefore I can say that x equals 56 divided by 5.3125. So let's try that now. So 56 divided by that answer I've just got gives me about 10.54 and 0 0.99 and some more. So 10.54. And obviously it carries on a bit more than that. So 10.54. So I can fill this in. So 10.54 is what x equals. So CD equals 10.54. In fact, it's a bit more than that, isn't it? So to be a bit more accurate, 0, 0.99384. Don't round off when you're not at your final answer. So from C to D is that length there. So how does that get us? Well, I'd always say if you can work something out, do work something out. So now we've worked that one out, um, what we could do, because we're trying to get to work out the length of AB, essentially we're trying to work towards this top triangle. So worked out this, can we start thinking about getting over to the top bit here? Well, because we now know AD, CD, and this angle in between, think about which one of these rules we can use next. Okay, it should hopefully occur to you that we could use a cosine rule to find AC. So a suggestion I would suggest we do is to find AC next. So the cosine rule for AC is what we're going to do next. Cosine rule to find AC. Now, all this means here is the side you're trying to find squared is equal to the two other sides that you do know squared minus double those two sides multiplied together multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two sides you do know. And this angle here will also be opposite to the side you're trying to find. And so if AC, I'm going to call that A, 
right? Then the angle opposite to that one, A, in our case, would be 105. And B and C, in any order, must be 11 and the 10.5409938. But of course, this would give us a squared, so a is going to be the square root of all of that. So if I square root all of that, that will then undo that squared thing there. So essentially, ac is going to be the square root of b squared plus this one here squared. 10.54 and so on squared minus 2 times b times c which is that 10.54 thingy times cosine of 105 so on the calculator i've got dc stored already so if i press answer that's going to give me that awkward number anyway. So I'm going to keep that stored on my calculator so I don't need to remember all these digits. It just makes it slightly easier. So to work out AC, I type the square root symbol, then 11 squared plus that stored answer squared minus 2 times 11 times the stored answer, then multiplied by cos of 105. Close bracket. Press equals, and for that one, I get 17.0919 and so on and so forth. So 17.0919 and a bit more, 0364. So I can write this in. And so now, actually, I'm not far off being done. So now we need to work out AB, which we always needed to. I do know an angle opposite to AB, and also I know an op another angle and side pair. So now what I can do to work out AB is use the sine rule. So final step, sine rule to find a, B. Okay, so in terms of steps, this was step one, this was step two, now step three to finish off. So the sine rule, the side you're wanting to find, divide by the sine of the angle opposite to it. So A, B, divide by the sine of of the side opposite to it, which is 48. Okay, now we're looking at the top triangle, by the way, so we ignore this bottom one now. So what I'm going to suggest is at this point, we're not going to think about this bottom triangle, we're applying the sine rule to the top triangle only. So at this stage now, to save any confusion, I'm just going to literally erase anything to do with this bottom triangle, just so it's not on your radar, so you're not considering it, hopefully, at all. There we go. So AB divided by sine of 48. Well, that's going to equal 17.09. One nine zero three six four divided by sine of the angle opposite to it, which is one one eight. And if I want to, I can work out what this is. So, what is seventeen point zero nine so on and so on divided by sine one one eight? So, I've got this answer stored on the calculator already. Okay, so I've got 17 point whatever on the calculator. So if I divide that now by sine 118, I get 19.35777 and so on. OK, 
Okay, so that's what I've got stored on the calculator. So this here is the same as this here. So then to get AB on its own, I could just multiply both sides by sine 48. So AB is going to be this 19.35777 times by sine 48. And then finally, we'll have our answer. So this thing here times sine 48, close brackets, press equals, we get here 14.38. So to one decimal place, this 3 is going to round up to a 4 because it's next to the 8. So we're going to have 14.4 centimetres. And after quite a lot of hard work, that's question 17 sorted and finished. Question 18, we've got a speed time graph for a train. And we need to work out an estimate for the distance the train travelled in the first 20 seconds. Use four strips of equal width. Now, if you've not seen a question type like this before, you can be forgiven for thinking, what on earth are they talking about? Well, what we need to know, ideally, is that, and this might be something you've encountered in physics, I'd imagine, um, speed and time are related by distance. So, essentially, speed is distance travelled divided by time taken. Okay, so this is what we need to recall speed equals distance over time so we want to estimate the distance if we cover up distance distance is speed multiplied by time so speed is the vertical axis time is horizontal if we multiply these two together we'll work out the distance essentially the area under a distance sorry a speed time graph that will tell us the distance so what this question is asking us is to divide up the first 20 seconds into four equal strips. So five seconds, 10, 15, and 20, and work out the area underneath this curve for four of these strips. So that's what we need to do first of all. So we need to divide it like so, 10, 5, 15, 20, and straight lines joining from the start of one strip to the end of it. So essentially you're going to have a triangle to begin with and then three trapeziums. So you need to work out the area of one, two, three, four of these, which I'm going to colour code like this. And when we worked out those areas, we've essentially done the question. So we need to work out the total of these areas. So we just can say now the distance, at least an approximation for the distance, is going to be the first bit, which obviously you can see as a triangle. How do you work out the other triangle? It's half base times height. Now, because you need to know the heights of these, actually what we could do with doing is actually thinking of this before we get started. What are the heights of these bars? So we need these to calculate. So just reading them off, we'd have this. So bear in mind, be careful of this scale. Each two little squares is worth one unit going up. So this triangle actually has a height of 2. This trapezium on this side has a height of 5, height of 10, height of 18. So now we can actually proceed. So the distance is going to be the area of these four strips. The first one, like I said, is a triangle, half times 5 times 2. That tells us for the first triangle. Now the others are trapeziums. So you need to remember the area of trapezium, it's half of the two parallel sides added together, then multiplied by, in this case, the width. The width of all of these trapeziums is 5, because it's 20 seconds divided by 4. Each strip is 5 seconds wide. So this two parallel sides, one has height 2, one has height 5. So that's half of 2 plus 5 times 5. So that's the green one done. This blue one, same formula, that's going to be a half of that one plus that one added together, which is 5 plus 10. Again, multiplied by the distance between them, which is 5 seconds. And then one more, the final one. 
we do plus a half. This time, that one's 10, that one's 18. So half of 10 plus 18. And again, multiplied by 5. So we just use the calculator carefully to total all these up. And then we're good. So very carefully with your calculator, because there's quite a lot to be doing. Um, this goes for me as well as, as, as well as you at home. Just be very careful how you type it in. Half times 5 times 2. Then plus one half of two plus five times five, then plus a half brackets five plus ten times five. By the way, if you feel more comfortable doing this step by step on your calculator with smaller calculations, that's fine as well. I'm just showing you that if you are careful and confident of the calculator, you can do it all in one go. And a half of 10 plus 18, and finally multiply that one by 5, we get a total here of 130. So you should get a total approximate distance of 130 metres. Part B, it says, is this going to be an underestimate or overestimate of the actual distance? Give a reason for your answer. The actual distance would be the exact area under the curve. And so are these four bars more than covering the curve or slightly less than covering? If they're more than cover the curve, it's an overestimate. If they don't cover the full area under the curve, it's going to be an underestimate. Now, you can see here, just about, these lines have drawn are slightly above the curve at each point. That's slightly over the curve. That's slightly over the curve, that red line. Same here as well. It's because the curve is curving like this, and I'm approximating it over. So actually, this is going to be an overestimate of a true distance. So we need to give a reason, something like this. It's going to be an overestimate because the top edges of all four trapeziums, I'm calling that a trapezium, but there you go, they're all slightly higher than the curve. So because they're higher than the curve, it's overestimated it ever so slightly. Question 19. Prove algebraically that the straight line with equation x minus 2y equals 10 is a tangent to the circle with equation x squared plus y squared equals 20. This, I think, is a particularly nasty question because it's not actually a question where you need to think about a circle as such too much at all, really. The key thing is you need to know what a tangent is. Now, a tangent is a straight line that touches a circle once and only once it just scrapes at one point so we need to just think about this if a straight line is a tangent to a circle the line and circle will meet only once another way of thinking about that is if we try to work out when these two are equal to each other when we simultaneously solve them they would only be equal in one particular point but only be one solution to these simultaneous equations and that one solution is going to relate to the one and only point where the tangent meets the circle. So if we solve these simultaneously and we get only one value, that's going to prove it for us. So this is a very dressed up simultaneous equation question. So we've got a linear equation here and one which is not linear here. The formula for working out how to do these is we need to get the linear one, this one, in the form x equals or y equals. So it's easier to get this in the form of x equals. If I just add 2y to both sides of this equation, then this equation here just becomes x equals 10 plus 2y. So that's what the equation is going to become. So now what we do is we substitute this value of x into this harder equation here. So this now, x squared plus y squared equals 20, becomes 10 plus 2y squared plus y squared equals 20, because x is 10 plus 2y.
Now for this one here, we need to square out these brackets. There's a few ways you could do it. Foil seems quite common. I'm not a big fan of foil. Um, I prefer this method. But as long as you can do 10 plus 2y all squared, then that's going to be key to tackling this question. My suggestion would be to do it like this. If you're multiplying out a bracket squared, it's the same as that bracket, 10 plus 2y, multiplied by itself. So in any order, we can do the boxes by multiplying what's above by what's to the side of them. So 10 times 10 is 100. 2y times 10 is 20y. This one, 10 times 2y is another 20y. And then this one finally, 2y times 2y, well 2 times 2 is 4, and y times y is y squared. And so this bit here, after expanding out, what do we have? Well, we've got 4y squared, 20y plus 20y is 40y, and of course plus 100. So we've got that, plus of course the y squared from before, that equals 20. So now we can neaten this up. So 4y squared plus another y squared gives us 5y squared. We just have 40y plus 100, of course. That equals 20. I can now get all of this onto one side of the equation by subtracting 20 from both sides. So if I just knock off 20 from the right and knock off 20 from the left, we'll now end up with 5y squared plus 40y and 100 take away 20 leaves of just 80. So this is the equation now we can solve. However, look at the coefficients, look at the numbers. I've got 5, I've got 40 and 80. All of these values I can divide by 5. So if I divide the full thing by 5, this just makes the numbers much easier to deal with. I'll then have just 1y squared. 40y divided by 5 leaves us with 8y. 80 divided by 5 is 16. So we now have y squared plus 8y plus 16 equals 0. I can now factorise this by thinking what two numbers multiply to 16 and add up to 8. Well, those two numbers are 4 and 4. So that's the same as saying it's y plus 4, brackets y plus 4. Or you could just say y plus 4 all squared. So therefore, this is only one solution for y, which would fit this equation. And that one solution is the same for both brackets. That's when y is minus 4. So now we can sub this back into x minus 2y equals 10 to work out the corresponding value of x. So now know that y is minus 4 when it's solved. If I substitute this in, get x minus 2 lots of minus 4 equals 10. Minus 2 times minus 4 is obviously plus 8, so I get x plus 8 equals 10. Therefore, subtract 8 from both sides, I get x equals 2. So I've got one value for what y would be, and one value for what x could be. That tells us there's only one point, which is when x is 2, y is minus 4, when this straight line meets the circle. Therefore, if it's a straight line that meets a circle once and only once, that is therefore a tangent to the circle. So we've proven it. So we just conclude by saying something like, because the line meets the circle at only one point, that point is when x is 2, y is minus 4, 
then we can say the line x minus 2y equals 10 is therefore a tangent to the circle. And that's all we need to say. Question 20 is a circle theorem question, but not quite as you might imagine. This is where you sort of prove your own circle theorem. So we're going to prove that the angle ACB, this angle here, is 90 degrees. So we're actually going to be proving uh, the theorem that the angle at the circumference is 90 degrees. So we mustn't use any other circle theorems in this proof, though. So what we need to do first of all for this one is we just extend a line from the centre O up to C. Now what we're going to have here is two different triangles now. Now this is a radius, that's a radius, and also this line here in red is a radius too. So because of that, triangle ACO and triangle OBC are going to be isosceles. So triangle OAC and triangle OBC on isosceles, therefore their base angles are going to be equal. So I'm going to say for AOC, I'm going to call these base angles X. For both isosceles, because both triangles have two sides which are radii, radius, radius, A to C isn't a radius, and for OCB, OB is a radius and OC is a radius, and so these two are going to be the same as well. Now, they'll be the same in this triangle, not necessarily the same as what they are in this triangle, so I'm going to call this one Y and that one Y. So, angle at A is x, angle at C here is x2, and I'm going to call this one y, and down here y2. So now we can consider the whole triangle. <clears throat> so if I just consider the whole triangle ACB. Then the angles in a triangle offer side up to 180 degrees. So X, in fact, you could say it more clearly. I could say that the angle at A plus the angle at C, plus the angle at B, needs to add up to 180 degrees. Now the angle at A is obviously X, the angle at C is X and Y together, and the angle at B is this angle Y, that must add up to 180 degrees. Now this will obviously simplify, X plus X is 2X, and y plus y is 2y, so 2x's plus 2y's equals 180 degrees. Now what we can do is just divide both sides of this by 2, and then we'll have exactly what we want. So half of 2x is 1x, half of 2y is a y, half of 180 is 90 degrees. So therefore, x plus y is 90, and x plus y is the angle at C. So therefore, ACB, which equals x plus y, in terms of how we've labelled it, that equals 90 degrees, which is exactly what we wanted to prove all along. Finally, the last question on the entire paper, um, a horrible vector question. So we've got OAN, OMB, and APB are straight lines. From A to N, 
that's double the length of from O to A. So let's label on what we know. So from O to A is vector A. And if A to N is double what O to A is, then from A to N is going to be two lots of A. O to B is B. Now one thing hasn't been given is from A to B. So think about how we could go from A to B. From A to B, we could go from A to O, then go from O to B. Now from A to O is along this vector A, but in the opposite direction. So from A to O is going to be negative A, then from O to B is just B. So therefore we know what a to b is, a to b is minus a plus b, like so. So it now says from a to p is k multiplied by a to b, so a p is just some fraction along a b, a k is just a scalar quantity, that means k is just an ordinary number, so k might be a decimal or fraction. We're also told that from m to p to n is a straight line. So this one here is a straight line through both. So we need to find the value of k. Because m, p, n is a straight line, that means that from m to p and from p to n, taken separately, they're going to be parallel. That bit of line plus that one are going to be parallel. So that's worth just mentioning explicitly because it's going to be key to how I'm going to prove it. So if MPN is a straight line, then MP and PN are parallel. And another way of thinking about that is they are in the same proportion, which I'll mention in just a second. So what I'm going to do first of all is think how I could go from M to P. To go from M to P, there's no direct vector I know. So what I could do, I can go from M to O first. Then once I'm at O, I go from O to A. Then when I'm at A, I can go from A to P. So, from M to O, that's going to be minus from O to M. Now, M is the midpoint of OB. From O to B is B. So, O to M is going to be half of B. But not only that, because I'm going from M to O, which is the opposite direction from O to B, I need to put a minus B, like so. So that's minus B. Then from O to A, it's just going to be vector A. And then AP is K multiplied by the vector AB. Now we worked out what vector AB was here, that's minus a plus b. So if I expand this out now, I get minus a half of b plus a, k times minus a is minus ka, and kb is kb. So therefore, MP, I can now factorise this a bit into lots of A and B. So I've got 1A here, minus K lots of A there, so that becomes 1 minus K lots of A. And then the Bs, I've got K here, and minus half the B there, so I can factorise this into K minus a half lots of B. So that's what MP is, so I'm going to bank that and use that later. We now need to think about what the vector M to N is. I could do P to N as well, or I could do from N to N. So what I could do here, in fact, I could just think about this in terms of M to N. So now, let's think about from M to N. 
I could do from P to N, but M's an easier point. So to go from M to N, I could go from M to O. And then I could go from O to N. Now from M to O, again, is going to be minus a half of the vector B. The vector B is all the way from O to B. O to M is just half of that distance. But I'm going back towards O, so it's in the opposite direction to vector B. So I put a minus there. Then from O to N, I go from O to A, which is vector A, and then vector 2A, because I need to go from A to N. So it's A plus another 2A, which is 3A. Now I'm just going to write this A first. So that's 3 lots of A minus half lots of B. I'm now going to return to this. And so this vector here, Mn, needs to be parallel to this one here. So now if we have a look here, these vectors need to be in the same proportion. So compare the coefficient of A to B. So the coefficient of A for Mn, to go from a half up to 3, I'd have to multiply by 6. However, because that minus has changed to a positive 3, that's the same as saying that the coefficient of A is B multiplied by minus 6. Because this one needs to be in the same proportion as well, then I can therefore deduce that this coefficient here needs to be minus 6 times the coefficient of B, just like we have in the vector from M to N. So that one again needs to be multiplied by minus 6. So zoning on this point here, I can now say, therefore, k minus a half, if I times that by minus 6, I'd get to 1 minus k. So minus 6 brackets k minus a half would have to be the same as 1 minus k. I can expand this out, so I get minus 6k, minus 6 times minus a half is plus 3, that equals 1 minus k. At this stage, if I add a k to both sides of both bits of the equation, then minus k will disappear from the right hand side, so this have equals 1. But if I add k onto this side, what I'm going to get is minus 5k plus 3. I've done this a bit of a back to front way, but never mind. So then if I take 3 off both sides, I get that minus 5k equals 1 minus 3, which is minus 2. Therefore, if I divide both sides by minus 5, I apologise, I've done this in a slightly more awkward way, but I'll stick as it is now, to be honest. So therefore, k will be minus 2 divided by minus 5. The minuses cancel, so k must equal 2 fifths, or as a decimal, 0 0.4. That's the final question done, and therefore the whole paper. So, well done for getting through that, I hope you found it useful. Do please like and subscribe and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to go through again. And thank you very much, legitimately, for watching. So stay tuned and I'll see you all very soon. Goodbye for now.